Hello and welcome everyone to the Be Waste Wise webinar of the month. I'm Akanksha Singh. I'm the community builder at uh, Be Waste Wise. Be Waste Wise is a nonprofit organization addressing the need for knowledge dissemination on waste management since 2013. We organize webinars and global dialogues with audiences across the globe, panelists and moderators. And today's topic for the webinar is legacy waste management opportunities and concerns. To tell you in brief about this topic, we have our uh, moderator, Dr. Brijesh Kumar Dube, who's presently a professor, Circular Engineering, Department of Civil Engineering, and also a chair for School of Water Resources, IIT Kharagpur. Prior to his present academic tenure in India, he has served as a faculty member of University of Auckland, New Zealand, East Tennessee State University, USA, and at the University of Guelph, Ontario, Canada. Dr. Dubey has more than 17 years of socially focused applied research experience within the broad fields of environmental, sustainable, resilient systems and circular economy approaches. He has been moderating the Be Waste Wise webinars for more than two years now. And today, Dr. Dubey is going to talk to three very learned experts from the industry. Let me introduce you to them. Dr. Manoj Datta, who's currently Emirates Professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at IIT where he has been teaching and conducting research since 1980. Professor Datta has been a consultant to over 150 projects in the areas of uh, geotechnical and geo-environmental engineering. He has been involved in planning, designing, construction and remediation of over two dozens of landfills and contaminated waste disposable sites across India. He has been associated with the Central Pollution Bo Control Board, Ministry of Environment and Forest, as well as Ministry of Urban Development in framing of guidelines and design manuals for municipal solid waste landfills. On the other hand, we have our second speaker for today's session, uh, Ms. Swati Singh Sambyal, who's a renowned researcher on research uh, on resource management and circular economy. Swati has been uh, in uh, working in India as well as across Global South on uh, development issues concerning integrated waste and resource management. She has been a part of National Geographic Forum on the Circular Economy. She is presently associated as the Waste Management Specialist with UN Habitat Regional Office for APAC, leading projects and interventions in India on frontier technologies for circular economy of plastics, evidence-based municipal solid waste planning, and Fukuoka landfill remediation. Our third speaker today is Mr. Sanjeev Kumar, who has more than 25 years of experience in environmental sustainability, circular economy, and waste management. He's currently clo uh, closely uh, working with policymakers, executors, industry, corporate houses, NGOs in conceptualizing projects, enabling execution with focus on circular economy and sustainability. Uh, before we further uh, proceed to the discussion, we would request you all to know that this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded on Be Waste Wise webinar uh, Web, uh, website and also on our YouTube channel. Please use the Q&A section and the function for your questions to the panel. You would like to introduce yourself, where you are from, why you're joining. We would request you to please use the chat function. Dr. Dubey has a poll for our audience as well, and we will request you all to participate in this poll and kickstart this discussion. Over to you, Professor Dubey. So yeah, thank you, Akancha, for uh, uh, setting the uh, setup, uh, like uh, setting this up. So welcome all. We will be discussing a very important topic uh, on how to manage the legacy waste. As uh, many of you who are from the waste management sector, from the Indian standpoint, 2016 rules kind of mandates as well. Every urban local body has to take care of the uh, those dump site. You can think about hills of garbage which is there in many urban uh, local bodies across country. And it is, this problem is not only in India, it's uh, in many other countries as well. So thing is that, see, if you don't manage it, it catches fire. Uh, right now, Kochi, uh, if you are following the news, you know what is happening in Kochi. We, we do hear things happening in Delhi, Bombay, Mumbai, and other places from time to time. And sometimes it also causes slope failure. Uh, let's say because of the steep slope that we have. So we have to somehow take care of these legacy sites. And they are useful land. And so one aspect is to reclaim that space for some other useful purposes. Other aspect is also is that can we reclaim some of the resource from there? That aspect of course, uh, 
we will debate today, like how much resource is really available in that uh, these legacy site and how to manage this uh, resource in an effective way so that we don't contaminate the other parts of the environment too. So the location today has actually earlier, these uh, sites used to be outskirts of the city as the city grew, as the urban areas grew, now they are kind of in the middle of the city. So it's uh, becoming a, an issue in there. So in terms of bio mining or landfill mining, as you want to talk about, we also hear ways to wealth. So is it really wealth? Like how much and how to make it wealth from there? Is it really possible? What percentage of the legacy waste can really be used for? So those discussion you will hear from three prominent experts, as you heard uh, from Akansha, their uh, background. So we'll talk about uh, uh, like potential. We also talk about risk from recovered material. Uh, like well, how much, if we don't, are we making this point source to a non-point source problem? These dump sites are a point source now. If you're taking those recovered material and don't do due diligence in terms of beneficial reuse risk assessment, what is in there, those so-called bio soil or uh, reclaimed soil, are they really clean? And uh, so we have to look at those aspects. So that's what uh, I, I hope to hear from uh, all my panelists. Uh, so I'll, don't take, I'll not take further time. I'll, uh, it, I'll, in, I'll invite our first panelist, Professor Manoj Datta, uh, who will be talking about uh, his experience of working in this particular sector. So Professor Datta, floor is yours for next uh, 10, 12 minutes. Thank you, Professor Dubey. Let me share my screen because I'll try and... Uh... Yeah, put it on slides. Is it uh, yes. visible? Yeah. Yep, it is. I think I've moved one slide up. Okay, so I am going to speak, uh, since I'm based in IIT Delhi, I'm going to speak about uh, what's happening on landfill mining at, of old dumps at Delhi. We've been sort of observing these from far. We are not involved in mining directly, but what is it that we are picking up from the three major dump sites that we have in Delhi? <clears throat> so we have three uh, very high dump sites, uh, Okhla, Bhalswa, Ghazipur, they're about 60 to 65 meters high. And the objective is if we can mine this waste and reduce the height of the waste dumps, can we completely remove the waste to recover the land underneath for reuse? So that seems to be the objective. And the idea is that can we get the combustibles, the building materials, the soil like materials, the compost out from this? garbage dump and see what uh, what we can recover. The issue of uh, reuse of the land, of course, depends on the contaminated soil and the groundwater below the waste, which nobody has addressed so far. So we've been doing studies at IIT Delhi, picking up uh, old waste from these three dump sites. Plus, we have picked up some waste from Hyderabad and other locations. We've been you know, segregating it, screening it at a very large scale. and. Uh, we basically find that the soil-like material and the gravel-like material constitutes about 70% of the entire stuff. Plastics and textiles are the combustibles which come out. Then, of course, there are miscellaneous materials like glass, etc. cetera. So uh, we looked at the screens in the, uh, in the field. What they are using are what are called trommels, rotating screens, with a productivity of about 200 tons per day per trommel. And at the three dump sites, about 10 trommels are being used. So we are talking of uh, 2,000 tons per day being processed every day from one dump site. And uh, we get about 20, 25% oversized material, which is basically CND waste. We get soil plastics and rags, which is about 5 to 10% waste. And what remains after that is about gravel sized material and soil like material, which I showed you in the previous slide. Now, from earlier, we were using two screens, 30 mm and 6 mm for screening. Now we are only using one because the 6 mm screen gets clogged because everything is happening very fast. The waste is wet. The openings get clogged with that waste and therefore it doesn't function properly. So what is happening is we are removing plus 30 mm material and minus 30 mm material. And this minus 30 mm material, which is now soil-like material and gravel, constitutes about 70% of the material which has been taken out from the landfill. So that's a waste dump for you at the top. And that's the trommel, as you can see, the cylindrical member and some excavators. So you excavate the waste and the oversized material, which you can see in the foreground, is the CND waste, which is hand-picked or removed before it is fed into this bin. 
It goes to the rotating screen. The oversized material is plastics and rags, which, dirty plastics and rags, which comes out and it gets accumulated here. You can see it flying all over because there's an air classifier with, with the jet of air, which throws out the plastics. And this is the plastic which accumulates at above the 30 mm size and the undersize goes up and comes out at the other end. And that looks like very nice soil-like material. Of course, it smells and everything. And uh, so we are basically getting three components, the CND waste, which, can, which, which goes to a CND plant from where you can make crushed aggregate and uh, sand and all that material. And also you can make pavement blocks and curb stones uh, for reuse. The fluff goes to the cement plants and the waste energy plants. The cement plants are a little uh, not happy if you send, send them soiled fluff, which means, you know, it's very easy to say, I'll send you very pure plastic, but it's impossible to clean the plastic unless you use a lot of air and water and a lot of processing, which is a cost. But waste energy plants welcome the fluff. And I think uh, cement plants also want that it should be in the form of pellets because their input feed has an issue with that, but not everywhere. So we come to the last material, which is the 70% soil-like material and gravel. What do we do with this 70% material? That's the question. That's the challenge. We can use it. We tend to use it like soil as a replacement for local soil in embankments, low-lying areas, abundant mining pits. And also there is this view that it is like compost. So we can probably use this like a compost for helping vegetative growth. So this is a, an example of a low-lying area being filled up with the 70% material. Now, what the 70% material, it looks strangely very similar to the municipal solid waste dump itself. The question which arises is, are there any contaminants in this material? Is it, are the engineering properties okay? And we've addressed this question, is this material hazardous? The answer is when you perform the TCLP test, it is not hazardous. So the TCLP test indicates that the soil-like material is not hazardous. Does it, does it mean that this material is similar to local soil? And the answer is no, it has high organic content. It has higher heavy metals. They don't cross the TCLP limits, but it is still higher than the adjacent soil. It has very high soluble salts, one, two percent of soluble salts. It gives out color with the water when you percolate it through it. So it has all these problems. So is uh, the soil-like material similar to compost? When you try and compare it with compost standards, the organic content is normally below requirement and the heavy metals are higher than the uh, uh, stated limits. So as soil-like material is not hazardous, but it is not similar to local soil and not similar to compost, and it is being erroneously called as inert everywhere. If you read in the newspapers, by the municipalities, oh, we are throwing the inerts here and we are throwing the inerts there. If you compare the properties with international guidelines for unrestricted use on land, this is not allowed. So it has to be, we have to make some interventions before we use it at other sites. So the engineering properties of this material shows that it is pretty similar to soil, but when the organic content is high, then you have problems, both the strength goes down and it has a time dependent compressibility or settlements. So the challenge in Delhi is how to dispose of this 1400 tons per day, which incidentally from three uh, dumps becomes 4000 tons per day of this material coming out. And for 4000 tons, if you have five ton trucks to be, you are 800 trucks per day moving every day to remove this material. Where does it go? Where does it vanish? So what is currently being done is that uh, it is being used as a surface application for revegetation, eco-forestry. It is being used as an earth fill for, laying, uh, for low lying areas. It is being used for embankments. It is being used in open pits, but it is being, it is an unrestricted use, which means there are no measures being taken to uh, seal it or uh, contain it. So according to us, uh, the, start, the studies at IIT Delhi, we should have, uh, when large thickness of earth filling is done, we must take some design measures. So really unrestricted use should only be in thin layers. Otherwise we should use sealing layers and isolation layers or even treat it, but treatment methods are still under development. So typically if you are going to use it for half a meter application to local soil, mix it up with the local soil and have non edible vegetation grow on it, it, it looks like this, it's all right. But if you are going to fill up low lying areas, one to five meter deep, or if you are going to fill up embankments five, 10 meters high, 
or even deep pits in the urban areas where in the past there has been some mining for sand or for anything, then you need to really put these ceiling layers around it so that whatever comes out of this does not get into the subsurface environment. We recommend that. And in a nutshell, world over this material which is mined, the 70% material is either kept at the landfill itself, reused at the landfill, or placed in new lined landfills, engineered landfills. It's not just uh, thrown everywhere as an earth fill material. But our recent NGT order directing mining of the dumps is causing unrestricted sp spreading of this material. And this can cause you know, contamination to spread over large areas. It may be not as intense as at the present point source, but it can in certain cases where water table is at a shallow depth, the soil is highly permeable, you can have issues with it. So we believe mandatory guidelines for design measures on treatment are required, and this must be undertaken Anna, as fast as possible. Otherwise, you know, what is the risk? We may remove this waste dump, which already has an existing plume, and nobody has addressed this issue that if you're going to reclaim this land, what are you going to do about remediating this subsurface soil? But this waste dump will go into a pit. This will become your new waste dump, and you'll get a new bloom at a new site. So we do believe that mandatory guidelines for design measures and treatment are required. So in a nutshell, this is the message I'd like to give from what's emerging at Delhi, that yes, trommeling and screening is fine, but we need to be very careful about where we are sending these and what are the design measures we are taking at the receiving end of the uh, mine material. Thank you, uh, Professor Dube. Over to you. I hope I have not crossed Thank my time. No, no, you were well within the time. Actually, you took less than what it was. <laughs> That's so all thank right. you. So we, yeah, we will have, we'll come back to, I have, I've made, it, uh, made some notes. I'll ask you some questions after everybody is done. Uh, so thank you, uh, Professor Dattva. So we will move to our next speaker. Uh, as uh, for all our participants, uh, you put all your questions on uh, Q&A, introduce yourself on the chat box, and we will take your questions towards the end. After all the three panelists do their initial, like the, uh, uh, initial uh, talk. So next in line is uh, uh, Ms. Swati Sambyal. So Swati, floor is yours for uh, next 10, 12 minutes. Please go ahead. Thanks, uh, Brajesh. I'll just uh, share my slides. Is my uh, presentation visible? Uh, yeah, good. All right. So I think I'll I'll start uh, right from where uh, uh, you know uh, the professor uh, left from IIT Delhi. That that though we may solve you know through biomining and other operations, what's what's uh, there at the topsoil, but what about the existing plume? Uh, is there a complete solution uh, to it? Uh, Coming to, if we look at, uh, you know, the status where we are, um, I'm, I'm sure all of us have access to these numbers, but uh, we are close to 377 million people um, and almost half of the urban population is living in our cities. And uh, if you look at numbers, uh, close to 62 million metric tons uh, of municipal solid waste is being generated every year. And, and almost 50% of this is being disposed. Uh, from a concern of GHG. Uh, we are seeing your uh, uh, slides, like we are seeing the next slide as well. So if you can change the display option. Okay, yes. let yeah. me try again. So sorry for this. And we can see your next slide. So the excitement of seeing the next slide goes away because we're seeing it up front. <laughs> so let me know if uh, it's visible yeah, now. I'm I put it on slideshow. Yeah, now it's okay. Now it's okay. okay. So sorry for that. No problem. So so clearly, uh, you know, waste generation is increasing uh, by five percent every year. And if you look into uh, how much GNG emissions come from municipal solid waste itself, it's close to two point six five percent. Um, if you look at CPCB's Central Pollution Control Board's latest data on dump sites in India, we know that about three one five nine operational dump sites are there. And uh, at such a pace, uh, we would need close to 1240 hectares of land per year and 66,000 hectares by 2031. So if we look 
from a figurative point of view, close to 1736 football fields would be required to yearly dump our waste. Clearly not something uh, that we're looking at. Now, uh, me and uh, Professor Dubey were just discussing before this uh, seminar started, the fact that uh, should we even talk about landfills or why should we address it? I think it's very important concerning the legacy of waste that's there in our cities. Uh, if you look from a legal perspective, uh, the Municipal Solid Waste Hand Handling Rules came in 2000. And the main compliance condition of those rules were the fact that every city needs to have a landfill and waste has to be collected and disposed. More of an out of sight, out of mind approach. And it's after 16 years that we moved to solid waste management rules where we now emphasize on segregation, processing, treatment, and, and landfilling being the last option. But clearly there is um, there are million tons of uh, you know, legacy waste that has to be dealt in, in cities, close to 4,400 statutory towns and cities that we have. So of course, a lot of operations and uh, you know, work is going on when it comes to landfill remediation. Uh, some of the prominent one work that is happening in our cities is biocapping and biomining and bioremediation. And if we look at it from a perspective of uh, what these facilities do, um, well, if you look at biocapping, uh, basically it's looking into recovered land, uh, which cannot be used for purpose other than park or landscapes. Um, and then if you look at biomining and bioremediation operations, uh, the reclaimed land can only be put to use after 15 years. Uh, now, within UN Habitat, we have worked in a few countries in setting up remediation systems on dump sites, uh, which is a Fukuoka method. It was uh, explored and developed in Japan and uh, been uh, on the ground uh, in Japan for many, many years. And it's been close implemented closely in about 15 different countries uh, across South Asia, across global South. And, and we've done a comparison of how these three modalities are very different. Uh, so far, Fukuoka method has not been uh, uh, you know, uh, put to pilot in India, but we've been exploring with the ministry as well as a few city municipalities on setting, setting this up. Moving back to the leachate management, uh, uh, of course, with biogapping, leachate and landfill gases are to be managed. Uh, uh, again, with biomining and bioremediation, um, the, the problem of leachate uh, is resolved. That's what the technology states. With Fukuoka, the problem of leachate generation and landfill gases is completely resolved. And additional advantage being the early stabilization of the landfill site. Uh, with biocapping operations, uh, maintenance period is close to 15 years. With biomining and bioremediation operations, uh, once the land, land is reclaimed, uh, there's uh, no monitoring that is required. Uh, so is the case with Fukuoka as well. Uh, with Fukuoka, if you look at the legal landscape, of course, uh, SWM rules talk about biocapping, biomining, authorize it. But of course, this one is a new technology. We are uh, yet to sort of set it up. Um, if you look at the cost and the expense uh, with biocapping, it's close to 800 to 1,000 per cubic meter. Biomining and bioremediation is about 400 to 700, uh, excluding the cost of mobile equipment and other variable costs. With Fukuoka method, it, it comes to close to 34 rupees per cubic meter. Um, again, it's a very low cost technology. Uh, which uh, looks into involvement of the municipal support as well as informal sector. Now I come to the opportunity part. Uh, uh, and, and of course, when we talk about biocapping and biomining operations, they are majorly private led. But with Fukuoka method, a major focus is around uh, you know, integration of municipal resources and involving the informal sector. There's a lot of echo I'm observing, uh, don't know why. So what is Fukuoka method? It's a semi-aerobic landfill remediation technology. It's been tested since 1975, and it's a standard uh, Japanese landfill remediation method. Um, it improves the water quality of leachate, suppresses GNGs, reduces hydrogen sulfide, and other volatile organic compounds, which are a major concern, and also enables early stabilization of the site. Uh, why we are looking into it, again, it's a low cost option, uh, which uh, as compared to other technologies that are there, it's locally adaptable, which means 
what what has been done in a developed country not has to be done here it could be adapted as per local conditions and it allows the reuse of land after completion much sooner than other methods very recently this has been uh, applied in uh, bahedar ethiopia and you could see the before and after pictures this was the site in 2018 and of course uh, this landfill for a for a lot of uh, notorious reasons has has come into news but but after implementation uh, the entire site has been remediated and has been put to use as an integrated facility. Uh, these are two different pictures showing conventional open dumping and a semi-aerobic type uh, remediation methodology. Uh, if you see the top draw drawing, it's a traditional landfill model. And the bottom drawing is the model using Fukuoka method, uh, wherein we see that perforated, perforated leached collection pipes are installed at the bottom of a landfill in order to effectively collect the leachate. And through the leachate collection pipes, leachate in landfills is swiftly removed uh, to outside of the line, landfill site. And simultaneously, fresh air naturally flows into the waste layers from the bottom of the landfill. This is due to the fermented heat confection effect generated by microorganism activity in waste layers. Uh, by applying this mechanism, even without electricity, a landfill is naturally able to improve itself to aerobic conditions by installation of leachate collection pipes at the bottom of the landfills. So that's in a nutshell, uh, you know, how the work is done. Um, again, some pictures of Ethiopia. Uh, as you can see, this these are pictures four months after project completion and six months after project completion. Uh, in terms of uh, the remnants uh, that were there, be it the, the soil-like material, which uh, in a previous, uh, you know, of course, there is a concern of where it has to be disposed. So, of course, the best use is of utilizing it back to the integrated facility or to the remediated site itself. So, these are some of the recent pictures of the site. Um, coming back to uh, another concern, uh, which, which is that before any technology or method on landfill remediation uh, you know, is set up. I think what's very important is a detailed analysis and characterization of uh, waste because without that, proposing technologies can be a failure. So of course, if you look into uh, the system set in various Indian cities, uh, one major concern across the cities that are shared is the lack of data, uh, which, which definitely uh, you know, makes the decision making faulty or the planning faulty in terms of what approaches of landfill remediation do you want to uh, take. Usually what comes into the truck to the site is what is accounted for, but that's really not the case. There are numerous leakages, there are a lot of formal and informal challenges channels which are usually not accounted for. So it's very important and pertinent to map various waste flows within your city, uh, to track where your waste is going, to track not only what's going to the dump site, but also where are your major leakages. And there are uh, you know, a few tools that could be explored. One tool that I'd like to share here is the Waste by Cities tool. Uh, we've implemented it in two cities in India, one being Mangaluru, another being Tiruvananthapuram. And we've tried to map the waste flows within the city, not just the formal channel, but also the informal channel, uh, whether it's going down the drain, whether it's being burnt, how much is being landfilled, how much is informally channelized, how much of it is formally channelized. So it's a very interesting tool, which is available uh, uh, you know, at our uh, online platform. So I would urge participants to have a look at it and explore uh, its use in your city. And the assessment could be done at both a city level scale as well as a colony scale, a RW scale, or a ward scale. So you choose, and you know you can easily uh, do uh, a quick assessment of the waste flows. Um, this, these were some of the data points that we charted uh, for a zero waste Mangaluru, wherein, of course, one of the focus was to minimize disposal and to make it more circular. But, but also to look into sustainable practices by looping in various stakeholders. And, and I leave uh, that, that whatever we do, whatever end measures we do, one major uh, you know, challenge obviously is advocacy. So uh, you know, we need to capacitate local grassroots organizations. There has to be sustained advocacy and awareness campaigns. Uh, we need to incentivize segregation. 
uh, and encourage more zero waste uh, avenues to, to minimize uh, disposal. So I leave you all uh, with that. These are some of the links that uh, uh, the group may find useful and uh, I'll be happy to take more uh, questions towards the end. Um, back to you, Professor Dubey. Thank you, thank you, Swati. So we are well being okay as per time as well. So next, uh, without further delay, I would uh, request uh, Sanjeev, uh, 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 Mr. Sanjeev, uh, if you can uh, take the stage. And yeah, next 10, 12 minutes is yours. Please go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, very good evening. Uh, uh, thanks for giving this opportunity. I would be just uh, presenting about what challenges and way forward we as a company, as an industry practitioner, which is uh, not only in bio mining, but also into circularity, into ensuring that the waste gets minimum uh, go to the landfill and how land can be reclaimed at fast. So we do have some practical uh, experience. Uh, the flow is like that. It has covered almost everything like legal dump site scenario in India, legal framework impact and issues with the bio mining of the dump sites, challenges, and what are the ways which can work. Next slide, please. So to begin with, I think this topic, uh, what uh, the waste wise uh, organization has taken is very much important, which is a national disaster getting up declared as such. It's moving towards for the last 15 days now, it is under fire. And the area was roughly to the tune of around uh, 70 to 100 acres of land, which had huge dump. And the uh, bio mining activity was so called going on for the last uh, two and a half years, three years or so. And is still in place in going in, uh, though the uh, bio mining was going on, a lot of more than 80, uh, 20 lakh metric ton was stored in the name of RDM being stored for the waste to energy plant. And these are the things which we have taken from media, and these are the some photos which caught fire and now the disaster NDRF team has been brought out, brought to safeguard the air and the water environment there around and to dose the fire. Still it is on. Next slide. Yeah. So the major contract was to remove the RDF bio mine from the space and uh, to see that it goes to the cement plant and also to see that the rejects goes to the landfill and also to see that other uh, recovered material. So uh, we have to see market as to where the recovered materials from this dump grounds, which is to have some material which of use, use to be disposed. If not used, then we are just opening up the large abyss or wound. Next. So uh, why we talk of, definitely one of the speaker has talked about the land. 2016, the rules were framed and landfill was to be considered in 2016. And before that also the landfill was one such major requirement. In spite of whatsoever segregation, whatsoever minimization, whatsoever recovery, landfill is the requirement. It cannot be, we cannot think of landfill without landfills. So whether we need to have the landfills something new or at a place where the waste dump grounds are there, that is how we try to find out what can be the short-term treatment, what can be the long-term treatment and how we balance in between. So there is a need for rehabilitation rather than going for biomining. Next. Dump sites, if you take about the number of dump sites, there are about roughly around 3,075. Madam said 3,177. So these data is roughly around 3,000 dump sites are there. Some dump sites have been reported to be reclaimed. Madhya Pradesh is uh, counting to be, these are the data which are taken from the authentic sources from CPCB and Mahua websites. Karnataka is having 15 and Kerala six dump sites to be reclaimed, whereas many are under the process of reclaim and some more have, may not have been reported. But some dump sites have been converted into SLF and capped, and these are the numbers. NGT has been very critical, and CPCB has been directed to prepare and ensure that all the dump sites should be uh, reclaimed by the NGT. Next. Impacts, abnormal, there is no point discussing on it. It affects air environment, water environment, ground environment, and obviously the air pollution and associated aesthetics and the pollution related in and around. Next. What should we, 
This has been defined in many rule, in the rules, in the municipal solid waste rules of 2016. This also has been defined in the CPHU guidelines and the CPCB uh, guidelines. That what should be done? It very clearly says schedule by IJ stocks of closure and rehabilitation of the old dumps by reduction of by biomining and placement of the residue in the new SLF. So even the rule says that you have to go do the biomining and prepare a landfill so that the rejects goes to the uh, SLF, though they are not hazardous, but they have a lot of organic material which cannot be uh, uh, dumped or uh, uh, placed, put in any place, as well as it cannot be just, uh, it, can, it has a property of having heavy metals which are leading to leachability, capping with geomembrane, cutoff walls or any other method. So SPCBs are required to provide the total numbers which they have remediated, bioremediated and it does not talk of biomining. And also it takes up bioremediation and camping to be given some timeline, which was March, 2021. Next. Guidelines, legacy waste guidelines by CPHU and CPCB says that in compliance to the direction, there should be stabilization of the waste recovered. There should be processing and there should be utilization of this screen fraction in a environment compliant manner. Next. So NGT and biomining has been very much in the news. NGT has been very clear, honorable NGT have wants that everything should be done in an environment safe mind with a guideline, but generally the projects do take its own course while being implemented. Next. Responsibilities of local bodies are very clearly defined with the uh, rule of the, uh, uh, as far as uh, biomining is concerned. Next, please make it fast. Okay. What is biomining not about? This is very important to see what is biomining not about. It is not about relocation of dump site. The whole problem is, is the biomining means we need to ship the entire 50 lakh metric ton, 1 lakh metric ton from one place to the other. If it has to be done, it has to be done in a scientific manner, understanding where the utility is. It's a complex technical considerations. I think a lot of people are there from uh, research institutions and all. Every dump site has got its own technical complexities in terms of characteristics, in terms of the groundwater, in terms of the air environment, in terms of the vicinity. So that is not being considered. It also has a complex economic consideration. If the distances of the utility of the resources are far, it has got carbon footprints and it damages the environment. It has got complex environment conditions. What should be used for? Real estate development on the land and nearby land. What should be the utility so that the real estate around the area gets up, uplifted or how it, what can be the use defined for the reuse of the land. It does not allow the near term real estate development. Generally, what is happening, these places are being considered that if the dump ground gets removed, there will be a huge upsurge in the land, land uh, real estate development. Next. Issues related. We don't have utilization of appropriate machinery. We are simply putting some few traumas with some sieves, which is thus doing it. It is the leachate management is not being done. Fresh waste continues. All the directions of honorable entity does talk about that key, there should be stoppage of fresh waste coming to the dump site. But fresh waste, so there is no material balance, no waste audit. Proper record is not, record is not there and development of at least there is no development of any myoremitation dump site. Next, please. There is a lot of gaps in planning and data. Planning is completely getting missed out when we are calling for tender as to what should be the uh, uh, execution plan, what should be the post-closure plan, what should the data of quantification and characterization, and city-level plan to find out where the alter alternate sites of inners going. There is a lot of research requirement, guidance requirement from academicians and researchers and the policy makers as to how to do that. And obviously there are issues of capability in terms of execution and outputs. Next. So the impact is very high. The impact on the residents near the dump site is very high due to dust and noise, movement of heavy machines and maladors coming from biomining process. Next, please. It also needs that technology plays a very important role because it defines the waste characteristics as a precursor. Based on the technology and the processes, there is a lot of capex required, a lot of money required to do that, and impact on the efficiency of the project as new technology cannot be brought into what can be done in other places. Theoretical and actual quantity, 
has to be there and the densities of all the waste components needs to be determined next please design and scale of operations leads to a lot of environment scale small scale dump ground remediation can have a different impact large scale will have different impacts middle scale will have different impact the impact associated with where the location is so those studies are missing out before we are going up next please offtake of the bio mine process first of all whether there is anything which is bio whether it is anything which can really be of good earth or compost or of a substitute to the manure so that needs to be looked into and where it should go with that organic content everything is being looked into as a part of npk whether it has got npk or not compost rdf inerts some inerts can be more than 70% generally it is 80 70 to 80% more inerts where will that go and also with the age the legacy of the dump sites needs to be looked into next so there are operational challenges infrastructure challenges contractual agreements challenges financial agreement challenges people are not get paid for because they find lot of issues coming up there are operational challenges which are all listed this will be uh, made available on the youtube so we can see that next please infrastructure and contractual challenges these are being called up for that within 2 years this has to be done then the within 2 years with such very high quality of investment made then comes the contractual and the cost who will bear the cost how will it get transferred into so these challenges do are there even the kind of main consumer being the waste to energy or the cement plants they are not able to dispose the segregated material because their capacities are not very high to ensure that this kind of a fluffy material are the raw material substitute next please next please i have already explained the financial aspect of it so it is a very complex process and there is no one size fit all each dump site has its own characteristics it needs to vary effectively on the disposal routes means where will the material go and detailed analysis and studies are required next please can so approach up, uh, what should be yeah sanjeev ji can we wrap it up we, we yes to... so the approach is basically to treat the how to have a legacy waste we have uh, we have practiced about three different kinds one was at patalguda which was about 20 acres of land the other is at 325 acres of land where we could declare uh, reclaim about 125 of acres of land in patalguda it was developed as um, construction demolition waste and in jawahar nagar where 125 was integrated waste management facility having all new facilities came up next please go fast ankit So these are the photos of the how Jawahar Nagar has been converted into. The major portion was to develop 125 acres of land to develop an integrated waste treatment plant for fresh waste and the ejects coming out from the inert waste. We also go to next. Uh, we also have a beautiful biocap landfill wherein we are taking out compressed biogas. Go back. Go next, please. Just go through the photos. So this is one such layout. Go, go back. Go back. One such laid out, which is 332 acres, out of which 125 acres was reclaimed to set up a new integrated waste management plant for the fresh as well as the inert coming out. Next, please. Go back. Next. 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 Make it fast. So this is the process how it was done. Next. It has. Uh, this is the capped landfill where biogas has been compressed. Biogas has been is being generated. So every material cannot give you resource. we have to also look into but the in situ treatment can also give you resource which is compressed biogas which is being happening at hyderabad next please so this is the gas which is coming out from the compressed from the dump ground next it it is generating around 600 uh, meter cube of per hour of gas to 5 tpd of cbg meeting all the duly requirements and being supplied for internal purposes as well as to the external bhag gas uh, uh, next sanjeev please uh, sorry but you have to uh, just yeah yeah it's last the last going on next next go on ankit next so this is the gas so these are the things so i think i have done through sir we can close down ankit we can close okay thank you thank you sanjeev ji for a very over like nice uh, uh, presentation so we'll open uh, now we have a lot of questions already came and uh, we have been trying to answer some questions uh, by different panelists is trying to answer that so uh, professor datta i have one question for you before i get to the uh, questions from the audience uh, see this tclp test uh, so we do use tclp to find out whether this waste is a hazardous waste or not but since this recovered materials are being used 
as you also mentioned that several places uh, which is not uh, tclp is simulating land municipal solid waste landfill should not be used uh, for example something like uh, uh, splp which is simulating the rainwater because that's what this waste uh, this actually recovered material will be exposed to uh, <clears throat> so i i think uh, my comments on this are that doing the tclp test to see whether you can use the material coming out from landfills whether it can be used in an unrestricted manner is not correct yeah, that's what the, yeah. Is only only to be used whether it should go to a hazardous waste landfill yes, or, not. or not yeah so we are just saying no no nothing comes out in tclp test even if you do the splp test you'll get the same answer that okay. the every level is below the required limit that is why municipal solid waste is called non hazardous if you do a TCLP or a SPLP test on the municipal solid waste also, it will not come out that the limits will be exceeded of the TCLP test. So yeah. the fact that the, uh, the, the, the values that we get from the TCLP tests are low does not mean that the material can be used in an unrestricted manner. Yeah. It will spoil the groundwater if the groundwater is very close, both yeah. from salts and for elevated heavy metals as well as for other contaminants. So that is what we feel. Of course, if the groundwater is deep below, it may not impact it so much. And since you are there, there is a question from the audience which says that if 70% of SLM require, again, some sort of uh, sanitary landfill type of arrangement, uh, are we just creating another dump site? So what's <laughs> that's, uh, your comment on that? I think you already mentioned, but if you want to add something to it. So no, my, my, my comment is very simple, that if we are going to move the material from the existing landfill site, that is a fundamental philosophical question which has to be answered. As far as we are concerned, we believe that the material would eventually remain at the old site or it has to go to a lined landfill site. So hmm. there's no way that if the material can be just used in an unrestricted manner. Yeah. If you want to use it, you want to put it in a pit, sure, line it up. Then it becomes, as somebody said, another another landfill kind yeah. of a situation. Another landfill. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There is a question, I think maybe Sanjeev ji, if you want to talk about that. What is the criteria for selecting different size screens while processing the landfill mine waste? How do you choose which uh, screen you have to uh, use? So it depends upon the location and the metro city and the kind of aging it is there. Mm -hmm. Generally, generally, uh, if it is a very large urban area dumping ground where you expect which where in the last 10 or 15 years, a lot of expansion or development has happened. These landfills do tend to have a lot of inert material in terms of construction demolition material on them. And you tend to have less of plastic or recoverable materials on the dumping ground. So there, the kind of material which is passed to like a star screen or a high density separator machines have to be part of it. Mm -hmm. But if it is a small town municipality where it has been uh, like say roughly around 1.5 to 2 lakh metric ton, which is a lower middle class kind of uh, economy, then it has got different trommel system. So a lot of study, what we say, it's a, it's a scientific study where a lot of research analysis and uh, characterization needs to be done before devising about the project on biomine. Okay. Thank you. And uh, uh, there is a question which is not that much related to our topic today, but I'll still take it. Uh, uh, maybe Swati, you can talk about that. It uh, says that, can we use uh, bagash uh, since you have been working on waste to energy, I, have, I always cite your uh, graph in our waste, man waste to energy lecture. So, uh, can we use bagasse along with municipal solid waste uh, in our waste to energy plants? Especially when there are sugar, sugar, sugar industries are present in those areas. You you have to. I mean, there's a lot of research happening in use of agri-based, uh, you know, uh, waste in, in uh, for incineration, but I think more than, uh, I also want a clarification, what kind of waste to energy are we exploring here? Is it incineration yeah. incentive or is it biomethanization? I would uh, be more favoring towards uh, biomethanization incentive operations if you're looking at agri-waste. Uh, 
over incineration uh, based uh, operations. Uh, so if uh, your question is, can we utilize it for biomethanization? Yes, why not? Could be explored with organic waste. But uh, incineration, I, I leave it at a question mark. I'm, I'm really not sure. Uh, we, we really have to also look into, uh, you know, the uh, some of the characteristics of Bagasse in terms of its calorific value um, and other factors to decide that. So maybe I'll I'll just get back and and share more details uh, uh, with you. Yeah. Okay. So there's a kind of question from Professor Datta, which says that uh, you mentioned that treated legacy was CND, RDF, SLM. Uh, out of that, CND and SLM is not a major uh, concern. Uh, it's non hazardous for rest RDF. Do we have sufficient market, sufficient market industry out there, uh, which can absorb all available RDF from RDC that uh, uh, from the legacy waste treatment in the country? Uh, do we have those kind of plants where whether the cement plants or other plants are available? So I have a, a limited experience on RDF. Uh, I have seen most of the time the tendency to use the combustibles in the form of fluff. Mm -hmm. Because creating good RDF, dry RDF, utilizable uh, RDF is uh, in itself uh, a challenge because of the processing involved. So my answer to the query is that, you know, the, the, the hidden story about uh, landfill mining is that nobody tracked the textiles, nobody tracked the rags. Mm -hmm. So what is burning is both the plastics as well as cloth. All the rags from your house, household are actually, you know, your shirt is going to a next guy, to the next guy, eventually the rags are reaching the landfill. Yeah. So these are, uh, uh, the conversion of the fluff to an RDF is, a, is another story altogether. But wherever the waste energy plants are there, they are very happy with fluff. Mm -hmm. Cement plants are not so happy because the fluff may not be clean. There may be a lot of soil in it. You know, it's very simple to say that the, the, the plastics come out, but it doesn't come out... Uh, clean. So this is a balance that has to be sort of made, whether you're investing in an RDF and are you able to produce good RDF or not. If there's a lot of uh, organics sticking on to the, uh, to the plastics, that also creates problems on, your, on the pellets that you create. I also want to address the issue of screens and, and trommeling, the size of mm -hmm. the screen. Sure. You can process the waste properly if you are first drying the excavated waste and pulverizing it, and then sending it to the screen. What is happening all across is everybody's in a hurry. We are excavating and what comes out is a wet, mucky mass. Mm -hmm. And to dry it, who's going to dry it? Either you have to need hot air to dry it, which is energy intensive. And if you are going to rely on father son to dry it for you, it's going to take many days. There is no space to dry it. So these excavators take it out and it goes into the uh, receiver bin. And the wet waste clogs your screens. And all these 6 mm's and 5 mm's and 10 mm's become clogged. Because you have not dried the waste and you haven't pulverized it so that all the fines can come out. So 30 mm is a very nice, I mean, I can I can see Sanjeev Kumar is smiling or for me <laughs> having told the secret of the thing. But 30 mm is the only one in which the clogging does not take place. So plus 30 and minus 30 or plus 20 or minus 20 is what is there. And even if you will go to the site, you'll see people standing on top of these traumas and banging them so that the, the, the clogged material falls down because the efficiency of the trauma goes down in the end. So the 30 mm comes from that. 6 mm we tried very hard. Lots of people worked with it. But now there is general consensus that if you don't dry your waste and don't pulverize it, the 6 mm is going to get clogged. It doesn't function like a 6 mm screen. Okay. I, I'm okay. sure uh, Sanjeev, Sanjeev will, will be able to give more on this. No, sir, very rightly said. Actually, the process is uh, uh, the way what you explained. Uh, the whole thing is that we have to find out a balance. Uh, we are in hurry to dig out all the dumps without understanding the implications either on the form of energy conservation or in the form of ecological and environmental risks associated. Now to do the dry run before it goes to trommel, there is an energy requirement. And in doing so, there is a cost. So these costs and all is not being factored in. What, what my uh, submission is that we have done three cases 
a small one a large one and medium one in the large one we find that the large dump grounds which are more than like ghazipur or bhalasawa or big big ones like uh, calcutta we have dhapa then belgachia so many ones so all those you need to have a rehabilitation plan with the shifting of the waste getting some land reclaimed and treatment of the fresh waste but with these small towns like asansol or maybe like say jhansi or some kind of towns where where is it there you go for a bio mining that too it should be in as a part of a substitute or as a pass of subset there has to be nearly 100 to 200 kilometers me there has to be cement plants otherwise rdf getting stored kochi today kochi is suffering only because that rdf was stored there had rdf not been stored it would not have like but, but the rdf is being unutilized rdf is being stored or is being kept in a very random manner on yeah. all the projects and while it is not reported in the papers the the rdf which is collecting which is not getting utilized is burning in all the projects there may be small fires what happened in kochi is it was a big fire so the whole problem of being able to tell the operator that the plastics and the rdf has to be stored in a manner that it does not get ignited even by a small cigarette spark is not being addressed so these are these little little mounds of plastics lying everywhere kahin kahin aag lag jati and that is in fact pretty uh, common now small fires because in the rdf then the operator gets to realize that he has to protect that uh, rdf in a more better manner Yes, sir. So there is a question like in Sanjeev, just since you are there, uh, they said, "Can which is this, this looks like somebody from Bangalore is asking this question? Can application of bio mining solve the current problem of Bangalore landfill? Look, this is Bangalore dump site or uh, uh, I hope uh, I I think that landfill uh, is a large one, a very big one. Uh, so. in fact for all the big large landfill i we recommend and we based on experience we recommend that it should work on a rehabilitation model rather than bio mining and taking away the rejects we need to create some space and this large bio mining uh, this large dump ground should be on a long term contract or long term thing that certain reclamation of the land with some portion of fresh land be provided for development of integrated project so that the rdf generated and the inerts which are high in heavy metals or is likely to have a potential of causing environment uh, damage should go to the secured landfill developed at that location rdf to be developed put into the waste to energy certain leach it to be properly managed and the balance can or may be looked into shifting to other places depending upon how the structures are there or maybe used for generating biogas this is what we we have done we are practicing and we propagate same thing everywhere rather than any smaller ones can be looked for an opportunity for bio mining so since we are talking about rdf any one of you either you or professor dr arivan swati if you want to chime in uh, there, there is a question from somebody from west bengal my state says that they are doing bio mining in west bengal but there is no takers for rdf cement plant is far away no waste to energy plant nearby no thermal power plant is not ready to take it so how to handle what to do with this uh, uh, rdf material like uh, they have no other option but to store it so what is the solution i i have no answers other than to store it i think uh, so we land landed into this issue while implementing a project somewhere and i think one approach could be also to find out where is the nearest rdf in the vicinity and if not on a quarterly basis maybe every 6 months transport it to that facility so of course storage is one area but also doing a thorough uh, fact check of the rdfs that could be there in the vicinity of this particular municipality or city and then look into sending this off or tying up with the plant uh, you know to send it every 6 months i mean of course not to dump or dispose it or burn it <laughs> yeah uh, since swati you are there there is somebody is asking that uh, why fukuoka method is not that popular in india as of now 
So again, uh, as I said, this is not being implemented. This has not been implemented in the country. And of course, there's a lot of ministerial procedures and CPCB procedures that one has to go through to pilot a technology or a method in the country. So presently, we are in talks to pilot it out in a few cities. We've had discussions with a few. Um, so yeah, I mean, there are, there are certain hurdles and processes that are involved to implement something new. Um, whenever we'll do it, of course, it will be at a pilot scale. As Sanjeev also mentioned, it, it would require details, detailing in terms of characterization, studies, understanding, uh, you know, the kind of waste uh, that is there in that land and accordingly devise it, considering it's a very adaptable technology. Yeah. So the Fukuoka so, method seems to be very close to the uh, the bioreactor landfill technology. Mm, yes, which, which yes. worldwide has not taken off as it was expected yeah. because the yeah. bioreactor landfill was also supposed to uh, do the aerobic uh, biodegradation and it was supposed to occur very fast. Yes. So instead of taking uh, 50 years, it would do it in 10, 15 years or even lesser. They're similar and. Uh, I think there are challenges in that as well. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, as yes. Dr. you mentioned, uh, as you probably know, uh, my PhD group from Florida, we were involved in doing bioreactor quite a bit. Right. And again, even in Florida, uh, we uh, demonstration plan we did, but uh, because of the operational challenges, uh, it really did not kick off. Uh, none of those landfill is doing bioreactor anymore, which we are uh, looking at around 20 years ago, or 15 years ago. So uh, this, this question is kind of a big, like a bigger uh, system kind of question. So I'll have Professor Datta to answer because of a huge experience. So he says the question is there's a huge gap in NGT direction to handle legacy waste and the actual implementation while complying with various CPCB and other guidelines. So why, why there is a huge gap? What is the problem? I think we all know the answer, but I think you can- oh, I think, uh, I think uh, there is no escaping the fact that you need a big, manual for implementing bioremediation or landfill, mi uh, sorry, bio mining or landfill mining, as you call it. And a lot of checks and balances have to be done as to mass balance, where are the inerts going? I mean, in some of the places, it's a mystery. We've been often going to landfills, which have said that they have done it very well, but we can't find where the inerts go. So if you have a good manual for this, a step-by-step -step and the design procedures and uh, the checks and balances, I think it can be implemented, but without that, it is going to be unrestricted and free for all. That's my only comment on this. Okay, and uh, there is, uh, this is kind of, we already answered this question, so we can go, uh, this is that, uh, maybe Professor, uh, maybe uh, Sanjeev, you can say that how long it takes for a legacy waste to really become uh, like a all biodegradable material has already degraded. Whether it's ten years, twenty years, thirty years, uh, when the biodegradability material is gone, uh, that will depend on the type of waste. But yeah, if you want to say something on that, very Sanjeev, difficult. That how many years yeah. it takes for the waste to become legacy? Legacy itself is that we, what is there since long and what is existing today. Uh, but uh, just having said that, the, see the whole thing is that uh, it has got two words. If you take about the NGT direction, CPCB guideline, as well as CPHO guideline, it talks about bio mining and bio remediation. Now, both these words needs to be uh, seen or executed together. Now, mining is something if there is something useful is to be mined but if that usefulness has to be as per the place where it is being used it should not be that somewhere so suppose some inert material which is having high organic and it's going into some marshy areas it is totally damaging the aquatic environment there but if it is going to a mined area where it is abandoned land or a barren land with no fertility and has a period of history of some uh, which is having, then the organic content may have some uh, lead to some kind of utility. So utility of the land where the recovered material is going is very important. Remediation is that in situ, there has to be some arrangement so that the waste which is being generated, I, I was trying to give one example of Deonar. Deonar, we got a very big dumping ground from where we got around roughly around 18 hectares of land. It was full of waste, but we were asked to 
remediate we were asked to fill it make it to a level and that uh, then construct a processing plant having waste to energy also into it you can understand such huge structures requires a lot of pile preparation which required a lot of construction debris and the material by doing so during the remediation we asked the corporation that give us more waste give us more area from where i can take out all the construction material to make the land ready for piling up so that is where the remediation so this why this kind of balance has to be there rather than just shifting place it can be used within the same place with some good material and some material may require to be shifted back to the land okay so dr dattatre is a question from probably from the audience it says uh, it could be for you for me it says that iit should undertake a project outlining the pros and cons of various pathways to address this legacy waste problem we have 4000 plus leach landfill sites all across india so why don't iits take it up but the question is who will fund it <laughs> so professor so you have given the answer all <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah if if I... people are ready to fund it we can do it isn't it <laughs> so yes. so okay i think we do uh, take over most of the question uh, Uh, there are some questions which you already answered in some way or other so uh, yeah i think uh, we have taken care of most of the question is already 6 11 so we have gone 10 minutes past so that's not yeah. bad so so again uh, thank you all professor datta professor uh, uh, so mr sanjeev singh uh, ms swati and i'll let akansha take over from now and do the formal closing. you know thank you thank you so much for uh, being part of this discussions and uh, making this more informative for all the attendees so far and um, as i mentioned earlier this webinar will be recorded and will be available on our website and our youtube channel and uh, we would like you all to stay updated on future events to so please subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on social media i would specially thank everybody on this platform to take time out and being part of this discussion and making it so so valuable for us thank you again thank you to all the panelists and also to all the attendees thank you have a good day thank, thank you for thanks everyone thank you thank, thank you. you everyone thank you thank you